Well, welcome all to the thesis defense of Lisa, uh, who, uh, who will talk to us about her uh, research in physics education. Uh, the title of her talk is Canned or Live, Investigating the Efficacy of Video Interactive Lecture Demonstration in Physics. The format is the standard format. She will give a presentation of about 20 minutes to half an hour. Then I will ask you to uh, <coughs> refrain from asking questions until the talk is over. Then the audience will ask questions. Then the audience will retire. The committee will ask questions. And the candidate will retire. And the committee will decide the candidate's fate. <laughs> Thank you. Shall we turn off the light? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lisa Carpenter, and today I'm defending my thesis entitled Can or Live? Investigating the Efficacy of Video Interactive Lecture Demonstrations in Physics. So to start off, uh, I'm going to describe the difference between a traditional demonstration, which you may have seen in an introductory physics course, and an interactive lecture demonstration, also known as an ILD. In a traditional lecture demonstration, the instructor generally shows students a demonstration and immediately explains the results to the students. An ILD is a little bit different. In an ILD format, the instructor shows students the demonstration apparatus, gives a brief description of what he or she is about to do, and then lets the students make a prediction about what they think the outcome of the demonstration will be. After students have written down a prediction, they then discuss the prediction with their peers. After this discussion, they can then go back and revise the prediction that they made originally, and it's only then that they actually see the outcome of the demonstration. Once they've seen the demonstration, the instructor then engages the students in a discussion about the relevant physics that they just witnessed. So why did I choose to investigate ILDs rather than traditional lecture demonstrations? Well, it turns out that research has been done on whether or not students' um, comprehension is improved through the traditional lecture demonstration format, and it turns out that their comprehension really improves very little. We're looking at a uh, less than a 10% gain in student knowledge um, using the traditional lecture format. Um, and multiple studies have been done on this. Um, one of the most prominent studies was done by the Missouri Group at Harvard. Um, the Missouri Group has also investigated ILDs extensively, and our own Kelly Miller looked at uh, the effectiveness of ILDs in the classroom and found that it enhances student comprehension considerably. Uh, we're talking 50 to 60 percent gains in student comprehension using the ILD format. But even if the ILD fa format is effective for improving student knowledge of physics concepts, not every physics instructor has access to lecture demonstration equipment. Demonstration equipment is expensive. It's challenging to store. In fact, at Burlington High School, where I teach, we have very little lecture demonstration equipment. We don't have the space for it, we don't have the resources for it, and as you've probably seen in the news, our funding is at risk and we do not have much, much money available to invest in demonstration equipment. Um, that and using demonstration equipment requires a lot of expertise. Um, I've worked with some, some really phenomenal people who have such a good understanding of how demonstration equipment works, and it takes a lifetime to understand every single demonstration apparatus and uh, the workings of it. In addition to uh, the inability for a lot of teachers and instructors to have demonstration equipment at hand, there also has been a, a really a large increase in the use of technology in the classroom. As a teacher, teachers are continually encouraged to use technology and integrate it into their curriculum. So given those two things, the lack of resources and the uh, increased use of technology in the classroom, 
it, it became my goal to find an effective way to integrate the two. So integrate ILDs with technology and investigate the effectiveness. So I came up with the idea of what's called a video ILD. So in a video ILD, um, students would see the apparatus on a screen and then go through the exact same uh, ILD procedure. They make a prediction about what was about to happen. They discuss their prediction with peers. And then the instructor would show them the demonstration, but instead of the apparatus being in front of the students, they would see it up on a screen. Following the demonstration, they would discuss the results with, uh, with the instructor, just as in the live ILD format. So it became my question, is this going to be as effective as having the demonstration right there? It's an interesting question, so I started looking at what sort of research has been done on the use of video in the classroom. I was searching and searching and searching, and I was not really finding much research about video instruction in the place of live instruction. I kept on coming up with um, studies on computer simulations, using computer simulations in replacement of laboratory equipment, study after study. And I found out that all of these research articles had come from um, the FET group at University of Colorado at Boulder. They employ over 20 people full time to develop simulations and to research them. So that explains the extensive research I found on computer simulations. But when I was looking for video instruction specifically, I was coming up at a loss. I found a couple really bizarre studies. I found one um, that a group had uh, conducted in, in China. The purpose of the study was to increase safe water practices in remote villages. And this group compared video instruction to no instruction. The result of the study was that video instruction is more effective than no instruction. I found another study that was performed in Russia, um, and the, the goal of that study was to educate youth about the risks of HIV and AIDS. Again, they compared video instruction to no instruction, and the same result was found. So it, it became obvious that I, that I was doing some important research by looking at the effect of video instruction versus live instruction of the same type. So I came up with my research question. Are video recordings of ILDs as effective as live ILDs? So in order to answer this question, uh, I designed a research study. I chose four demonstrations in physics. Um, and my intention is to uh, present these demonstrations to high school physics classrooms. Um, I'm a high school teacher, so it made sense to look at interactive lecture demonstrations in a high school setting. So I chose four kinematics demonstrations, which I will describe in a minute. And then with the help of Dave Hammond, we made video versions of each of the demonstrations. I then went into about 20 high school classrooms and presented these four demonstrations to each group. Each group saw two of the demonstrations in the live format and two of the demonstrations in the video format. And I also went to a variety of course levels in order so that I could generalize this study to the entire high school population. So I went to conceptual level physics classes, I went to regular college prep algebra physics classes, and I went to honors um, classes which uses more extensive algebra and trigonometry. So the demonstrations that I chose were racing balls. Racing balls is a demonstration in which there are two balls that race down a track. So this is actually what the students would see in the um, video version. So they would see the two tracks and the two balls, and they would have to make a prediction about which ball is going to finish the race first. And the predictions were made in the form of uh, multiple choice questions. It said, will the ball in front, will the ball that, that accelerates win? Will the ball in the back win because it travels a shorter distance? Or will the balls tie because they start and end at the same height? So you can make a prediction in your head right now, although if you saw my proposal, you might remember the results of this demonstration. 
So then once the students have seen, made the prediction, they would then see this video. And then just as I would do in the live version, I switched the balls to convince the students that one ball is not different than the other and there's not some sort of magic ball. And so at this point, I would then engage the students in a discussion. Why did that ball that accelerated and decelerated win the race, and what's the physics behind it? The second demonstration that I showed was balls dropped and shot. In this demonstration, one ball is shot horizontally and one ball is dropped, and students have to make a prediction about which ball will hit the ground first. And this uh, demonstrates the independence of uh, different axes. The third demonstration is pop cart. In this demonstration, a ball is placed inside of a cart. The cart is pushed and then moves at a constant velocity down a track. When it goes past a trigger, the ball is shot vertically up. And students have to make a prediction about whether the ball will land in front of the cart, in the cart, or behind the cart. And this demonstration uh, illustrates the fact that uh, forces are needed, unbalanced forces are needed to uh, change the motion of an object. And the final demonstration, my favorite, but this is actually the most dangerous to one, one to do in the live <laughs> format. Um, you place a massive, about 30 pound lead brick on your hand, you place a red brick on top of it, and then you smash um, the bricks with a hammer. And in this, this demonstration was the most challenging to ask the students to make a prediction about. So I asked them to make a prediction about whether the hand would be harmed and then why. So it was, do you think the hand will be harmed because the force on the brick is large? Do you think the hand will be harmed because the acceleration of the brick is large? Etc. So they had to uh, get the difference between forces and acceleration. So it's important to note that when I was making video versions of these demonstrations, I was not trying to exactly recreate what students would see in the live format. These two media are completely different media and they each have different advantages and disadvantages. So I wasn't trying to say, well, you'd never be able to zoom in on a demonstration if you're sitting in the classroom, because you can do that with the video format. You'd never be able to slow down into slow motion. You can do that with video, and that's one of the advantages. So there are definitely differences between them, and that's just one of the things that I had to take for granted. So for example, uh, one of the more interesting differences between them, when students see something live, they've seen it with their own eyes, seeing is believing, whereas if they see it in a video format, there's the chance for Photoshop, for special effects, so there might be that little uh, is seeing believing effect. Um, so that this research that I did is kind of getting at <coughs> whether or not seeing is believing in the video format. So to collect data, I created three assessments. One question showed up on all three assessments for each demonstration. So I could watch, look at the differences um, over time. On the the pre-assessment was given before students saw any of the demonstrations. The post-assessment was administered at the end of the class period. And the long-term assessment was administered uh, one to three months following the following the demonstrations, and that was uh, to look at long-term retention. The questions on the assessments were basic multiple choice questions. Some of them had diagrams, some of them had pictures, some of them just had, had words, um, but students responded by circling a response. In order to analyze the data that I collected, I put it into an Excel file, and then used a statistical analysis software called SAS. Um, SAS makes it pretty easy to uh, do what are called chi-squared test comparisons. And then from the chi-squared test, you can easily uh, generate what's called a p-value, which I'll explain in a moment. So a chi-squared test is basically a goodness of fit, fit statistic. It's looking at how different two groups are from one another. Uh, and what you're doing when, when you're performing a chi-squared test is testing a null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis in this case is a statement that there is no difference between the video and live formats. 
from the chi-squared number, you can then generate a p-value. Um, so, oh, and you can see that if, since you're comparing the two to each other, if you get a large number for your chi-squared, it means that the groups were pretty dissimilar, whereas if you get a smaller number, it means they were closer uh, to each other. And so then the p-value is the opposite. So from your chi-squared test, you take the number of degrees of freedom, and you look at uh, a table to figure out um, what your p-value is. Your p-value is the probability that differences you see between the two groups are due to random chance. So the smaller the p-value is, the greater chance there is that there's actually some sort of inherent difference between the two groups. Whereas large p-values suggest that any differences you did see were just random differences between the two, just like you would see with error bars. Um, so for this study, any p-value greater than or equal to 0 0.05 um, suggests that there's no statistically significant difference between the two groups. And the larger your n is, the more confident you can be in saying that your p-value will tell you whether or not there is a statistically significant difference. And for this study, um, for the demonstrations overall, my n was 75. So there were 75 students who saw a demonstration live and 75 students who saw the demonstration in video format, which is a, a, a pretty large n. So I'm pretty confident in my results. So the first step was to compute a p-value um, for the two groups on the pre-assessment question. The purpose of this was to uh, ensure that the groups had equivalent aptitude. And when I say aptitude, I mean, do the groups have the same knowledge of the topic before seeing the demonstration? If I had shown all of the video version to my conceptual classes and all the live version to the honors classes, I wouldn't be comparing this, I wouldn't be comparing equivalent aptitudes. So the first step was making sure that the groups had equivalent aptitudes. Um, once I confirmed that the groups did have equal aptitude, I then compared live performance on the post-assessment to video performance on the post-assessment to look at the knowledge gain. So I was making sure that I was seeing if the knowledge gain of both groups after witnessing the demonstration was the same. And then I did the same thing for the long term to see if both groups retained the same amount of knowledge over time. So this is a sample graph uh, for one of the demonstrations. This is for the pop cart demonstration. The V stands for the video group and the L stands for the live group. And you can see the first, the first set of bars um, was performance on the pre-assessment. And you can see just by looking at this, they had equivalent aptitude. And I can confirm that by then looking at the p-value, which was 0 0.63. 0 0.63 is well above the threshold of 0 0.05, so I can conclusively say that these groups have no statistically significant difference between them in aptitude. And so then we can look at the post-assessment results, and again, you can see both groups gained a considerable amount of knowledge after witnessing the pop cart demonstration. Um, through the ILD format. And again, the p-value was considerably higher than 0 0.05 at 0.44, which uh, suggests that there's no statistically significant difference between the two groups. And the same thing for long-term. You can see that the knowledge dropped a little bit over time, but still considerable improvement over the pre-assessment. And again, the p-value for that was significantly high. And I saw these results for all four of the demonstrations overall, which allows me to make the conclusion, overall, there is no statistically significant difference between live and video ILDs. So when I saw that, I breathed a sigh of relief <laughs> because I desperately want to be able to show demonstrations in my physics classroom where resources are, are not the same as they are at a, a large university. Um, before, I always felt like I was kind of cheating my students by showing them a video version of a demonstration. I always felt a little bit bad about it. Oh, we need to have the demonstration apparatus right here. You'll get so much more out of it if it's in front of you. But that's not the case. 
So my research conclusive, shows conclusively that I can use the video ILD in my classroom. As long as I'm using the ILD format and students make a prediction, they're going to get just as much out of the demonstration as if they were to see that demonstration live in front of them. I will admit it's not as much fun <laughs> to just pop up a YouTube video of a, of a demonstration, but the main point of showing the demonstration is to really engage students in the process of thinking about the physics and gaining something from the physics. This is also really a really, really um, good result given that teachers are being encouraged to use technology in the classroom on a regular basis. So it's good to know that when we do show a video of some sort of instruction that students are gaining just as much out of it. So there really are two, two big implications. It's that the video ILDs can be used where we don't have access to, to demonstration apparatus and that we can bring te this technology into the classroom uh, with, with a level of confidence. So there's definitely some more work to be done. I saw that in the group of students that I work with, which is the conceptual group, some of them didn't didn't really get much didn't get as much out of the demonstrations as the regular classes or the honors classes. And so it'd be interesting to figure out how the format can be improved to reach even more students. You can do things with video that you can't do with a live demonstration. So it's a good question to ask. Can we improve this even more so that it's even more useful for students? Should also look at what factors um, either enhance video ILDs or diminish them. Um, such as what if you were to give students the ability to interact with the video one-on-one? -on -one? Give them the ability to replay it when they get home at night. Um, is that the, Will that enhance the efficacy, or is just watching it one time in front of the class enough? There's also been a lot of push towards uh, remote classrooms. So areas, uh, areas that are more remote where students don't have access to a quality teacher in person, we're trying to provide opportunities where um, students can be in a classroom in the remote internet world. Um, so it would be interesting to see if there's a way to engage students in the, IL, in the video ILD format when there's not a, a teacher present with them. So that's another area of research. So this finding doesn't do much good unless teachers know about it and um, have video ILDs at their fingertips to use in their classroom. So one of the first steps is to create a tutorial on how to use the video ILDs in the high school classroom and beyond. Um, another thing is to build a complete library of every demonstration imaginable um, that would be available as a resource for instructors. I would envision this would happen on YouTube. In fact, I've already created a YouTube channel called Video ILDs, and I've uploaded my four the four demonstrations that I described earlier. I'm not sure if it's gotten any views yet um, because it would need to be advertised. Um, and that has to do with increasing awareness. So uh, posting on Facebook, putting out Twitters to um, people who follow education hashtags, um, posting on um, edge blogs, et cetera, and um, spreading the word at professional meetings like the AAPT meeting and the National Science Teachers Association meeting happening in Boston next week. Um, and then my goal is to also publish these results in the Physics Education Research Journal and the Physics Teacher. So this was an incredibly useful research for me because I'm actually using it in my classroom. So anytime I want to show a demonstration, I pop up a video, I ask students to make a prediction, I use the ILD format, and I know that my students are gaining just as much knowledge from it as in a lecture hall where they would see the demonstration in the live version. 
Um, a huge thanks to my advisors, um, Dr. Chu and Dr. Spartalian, um, to my committee chair, uh, Sheila Weaver, and to um, Dave Hammond, who helped me record all of the all of the video IODs. Thank you. into long-term retention or creation of physics majors on this? Creation. Oh, no. So, in terms of knowledge gain, you've said no statistical significant differences between seeing it live, seeing it as a video. But in terms of the number of high school students who then go on and want to major in physics or take a physics class in college, their long-term engagement might be different than their individual knowledge gain. That's an interesting question. So looking at their level of excitement about physics following the two formats. You know, seeing your professor fall off a table doing a demonstration versus <laughs> watching a perfectly delivered YouTube video. I think a lot of us have memories of the lecture demonstrations. And it wasn't always just what happened, but the process of doing the demonstration that wasn't a video that was actually an engaging thing for long-term development beyond just the knowledge base. Uh, I did not look into that. That's a fascinating question. My main goal was to make sure that the, the knowledge gain was similar, but that would be a great next step. Um, you mentioned briefly at the beginning that there's been a lot of research done into uh, simulations, which I haven't read much of. But I was just wondering uh, with, if even just casually in your research, anything with uh, simulated videos versus what appear to be recordings of actual events. Because I know that just in, in the experience teaching some students here, the idea of cartoons being physically, uh, being, you know, physically accurate or cartoons that do unphysical things and that doing weird things to their comprehension. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that stuff. I haven't seen any research on that. Uh, that, again, would be another interesting study. Okay. Um, so this is a little bit out there, but it was something I was thinking of. So, so all the demonstrations you've done, and it's probably having to do with what the actual course material is for high school students, mm -hmm. but it seems like it's all based around uh, sort of kinematics, right? And so have you thought about, is it different when you move on to something maybe more abstract, such as electricity and magnetism, where it's something students might not be so familiar with? You know, they've thrown a ball in the air, they've seen it come back down, they've rolled balls down the place. But when you start getting into maybe a little bit different things, do you think that would change sort of the results you've seen here, when it's something that they're not so familiar with? I, I don't think it would. Think that, but and that's just based on on the fact that if you can record the demonstration and show students what ha what's happening, there doesn't seem to be a difference between whether you see it live or up on a screen. You're still seeing the right. same thing. Yeah, I just figured it'd be more. You know, it's something much more familiar. I think that most students in high school have played with balls, rolled balls down, things like that. When you get into something. A little bit different, sort of electricity magnetism, where it's perhaps tougher to wrap your head around that they're not so familiar with. I'm just curious, and, and I think that's probably got to do. I don't know if they really get into that in high school, if they just do mostly. Um, Depends on the high school. Yeah, place. yeah, I'd imagine, yeah. But the key points that have been discovered to make a difference are making a prediction mm -hmm. and right, right. prior introduction to the topic. So, um, Kelly Miller with the Missouri group at Harvard has done research on that, and those were the two key points to getting the most out of seeing any demonstration. And so, I, I think she found the same thing for electricity and magnetism yes, demonstrations, yes, yes. and she wasn't doing the live versus video, but she found that the key points were you have to get students to think about the what's going to happen beforehand, and basically making an investment in it, and whether they're prediction of the outcome is correct or incorrect makes no difference. Right, right, yeah. They still gain the same amount from the demonstration, even if they got it right, then they're, 
their prediction is confirmed, or if they got their prediction wrong and they have to rethink what happened, it's the act of writing down a prediction. Or the prediction really makes the biggest difference, it seemed from her. Right, so I, I, I would assume that with any demonstration, if you engage in that way, you'll get the same amount out of it. I, I just want to follow up on your answer if that's possible. So if you look at the classic e &M demonstrations that we do here, right, the cow magnet one, the jumping ring, the Van de Graaff, all of those things, what do they all have in common? In the end, there's some e &M thing which results in a mechanical thing happening. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So the kids still get that. Where they fall down is when you do double slit interference right. or something. Something that they don't, like the, the end result of which is not something they've experienced in their real life. Exactly. So all the e &M exactly. demonstrations that really work well have some mechanical thing at the end that happens. So that's where I think Yeah, that's kind of what my question was, was probing at, is that it would seem that, that if it's something that they at least have experience with, fundamentally it would be easier to understand than something they haven't encountered yet in their life, I guess, right? Yeah. Bringing in this life experience of what happens when I do this. But yeah, no, that's... So that's the anchor, the mechanical the bit is the anchor at the end. Mm -hmm. And they encounter the same barrier witnessing the live demonstration, too. It's right, yeah, yeah, exactly. They're not really exactly. sure what's going on. Yeah, yeah. It's, they encounter the same barrier, it's just in a different medium. Thank you. So, two part question. Um, the videos doing this kind of stuff are decades old at this point. I remember laser disc collections <laughs> of kinematics demonstrations. They, we still have them. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, we already have them? <laughs> <laughs> do. And they're really yes, nice production so. values. So, does it still count as technology? Video is so passe, it's, it's kind of so pervasive. If what teachers are being forced to do is bring technology into the classroom, a smart timer, you know, something that gives you millisecond time resolutions with a photo gate, seems like technology, whereas a YouTube video doesn't at this point. So that aspect of technology, and then we've had these videos for decades, and yet we still do live lecture demonstrations. What explains the persistence of the lecture demonstration if we've had the videos for so long and they're easier and just as effective? Well, we didn't know that they were just as effective before. I didn't find any research on the topic. Um, it's fun to show a live demonstration. If I were showing a demonstration here, I would choose to show it live because maybe it's because of that engagement factor. Um, it's more fun for me, too. Um, but where I don't have access to the demonstration, I'm going to show a video ILD rather than showing nothing at all. And then the technology part. The technology piece. Actually showing a video in, in class is, is quite high level technology for some of our teachers. Um, we are being encouraged to use more interactive technology um, that can accomplish a different task, like social media, uh, pu publishing something to the web and having people from all over the world give their input. We're trying to do different things. We're being encouraged to do different things with technology. Um, but I think it's a good place to start, that just to, to make sure that the basic technology we're using is effective. I, th I have a follow-up answer to you. And that is, yes, those uh, lecture demonstrations have existed for decades. But the question is, when they were recorded, were they recorded having the ILD presentation in mind? Because the way, oh, right. the way you record it is different when you have to stop and explain and ask the students to predict, show the apparatus. So I think it's a matter of a little bit of, of how this thing is recorded. Is the quality a lot better on hers too? I haven't mean, seen them, but... Uh, the ones I'm thinking of, they set it up and there's even like, it pauses and says, what do you think will happen? Yeah. And then... Some of those old Bell Lab ones, you know? Yeah, the old Bell Lab, there's, and you know, it's, there's hundreds of them. So I and don't read them the wheel. Quality if they're that old. You know, oh, maybe hers are more clear. They're not high def. They're <laughs> <laughs> not high definition. Well, that's what I mean. So I guess it's better. Um, but, oh, but how much of 
of ILD is the video itself and how much is the teacher taking the time to make the students have predictions. Does, mm -hmm. does the video actually matter that much for ILD versus video? Or you could take the same video and do a bad video presentation or a good ILD presentation? Well, that was one of the suggestions for further research is what factors enhance and diminish right. the effect of the video. Does the HD make a difference? Does, the, does zooming in make a difference? So that's an area for further study. Um, but my inclination would be most of the ILD process is, is placed on the instructor to engage the students. And it takes a considerable longer amount of time to present in ILD versus a traditional lecture, but you get that knowledge gain by engaging the students. But yes, and it's a practice that it, a study has, was done about um, whether ILDs are more effective when the instructor has been showing them for a long time, and, and they are. It's, there's a learning curve to introducing any instructional strategy in your classroom. The first few couple times you do it, you don't do a very good job of it. And I saw the same thing, but, um, but I started doing um, ILDs years ago. So by the time this study, by the time this data was collected, I had already perfected the process of engaging students in the ILD procedure. Okay, I'll just make a comment. First of all, thanks for uh, rendering part of my job irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize we would come to this place when I was helping you. But, <laughs> uh, and the only other thing I'll say for a live demonstration, and this probably more peculiar to college level students, particularly engineers, is they will like to actually come down front and do a 360 on that. <laughs> uh, especially the more complicated ones actually ask maybe more detailed questions about what's going on. Anybody else? Thank you. Your general audience.